Yeah, so I, I, I see that the um, scripture itself is a little, or the message itself is a little confusing. I, I want to explain it because I told you guys last week we talked about inspiration, remember? And I said I wanted to give you the ironic inspiration of how this came to be, how this message came to be. And we're always taught to stick to our lane when we're talking about something. Talk about what you know. And for me, sometimes that's teaching or it's, or it's farming or it's deer or it's fishing. And Liz's biggest critique whenever I do these things is that I might not appeal to everyone. I'm not casting a broad enough net. And that I might not be getting my point across. But in the council meeting, when we thought that the pastor needed someone to come in here and fill the pulpit, Kurt made a suggestion that I do it. And Liz said, oh, yeah, 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 go ahead. You do it. Just do it on like fly fishing or something. <laughs> the Holy Spirit jabbed me in the, in the side and said, you see, I'm working miracles here. <laughs> so now that I have the attention of a handful of you and the rest are nodding off, uh, if you don't like it, blame Liz. So, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We're gonna, I'm going to go into the scripture, but I'm going to back it up to, uh, to verse 12. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put into prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which was by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by, the, by Isaiah the prophet, saying that the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the sea, beyond the Jordan, that Galilee of the Gentiles. Okay? So first things first, Jesus goes after the big fish. He goes after the tough one, the difficult, the faithless, the pagans, the tax collectors, the prostitutes. You have to understand that Jews and Gentiles hated each other and that I'm sure that the people surrounding Christ were shocked. They were shocked by the fact that he was going to preach to these Gentiles. And Jesus, I'm sure, had to tell them, look, I'm just doing the Messiah stuff that the, that the prophet Isaiah said the Messiah would do. Because Jesus, metaphorically speaking, came to save all the fishes. It doesn't matter if you're a trout, a bass, or an Atlantic sturgeon. He came to save all of them. And that included the Gentiles. Verse 16, the people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region of the shadow of death, them, a new light has dawned. So Jesus shined his light, right? VBS kids, right? Right, Hadley? Shine Jesus, shine Jesus light. 17, and from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee and saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the, and John his brother. And in the boat, Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called to them, and they immediately left the boat and their father and followed him. But that's divine in itself, that they just dropped what they were doing to follow Jesus. And I want to ask you a question. You just answer it internally. I feel like you'll be more honest with yourself. You answer it internally. Right now, are you on the bank mending your net or are you actively fishing? Do you hear Jesus' calling? Or are you so caught up in trying to mend your net and fix your own net and fix your own way that you're letting those around you get away? Because I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but you're never going to fix your net. You're never going to be able to. You'll always have a broken net. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And you see, Jesus was human. And in being human, he knew that he needed help. He, needed, he knew that he needed to make fishers of men, to make fishers of men, to make fishers of men, to spread his gospel. And I want to make that clear that today, that I'm not talking to the fish. I'm talking to the fishermen. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to those online that are sitting here now. I'm talking to the teachers, the disciples, the kingdom growers. If Christ needs help spreading his own gospel, what do you think Pinto needs? I got a gift, if I can keep this paper from blowing away. I got a gift that was given to me by one of our own, Brother Wayne Yoder. 
found out, I guess, somehow through social media or somehow that I was getting into fly fishing. And he handed down to me all of his fly tying materials. I can't even bring it all out. He's so organized, <laughs> makes me sick. <laughs> but I'm so, I'm so thankful that he gave me this stuff. And, and in here I have, I have a fly tying vise, something called a bobbin. I got some dyed feathers, mallard's wing, peacock feather, yarn, a squirrel's tail. What is all this? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> because if I was a betting man, I would say that Wayne did not get into this because he was trying to catch trophy fish. I would guess that it was probably for his love of entomology. Bugs, the insects, the aquatic life that's in there. See, there's a term that's used in fishing. A term is called match the hatch. And what that means is that you're creating food that the fish are feeding on during the certain time of year that they're feeding it. Winter might be eggs. Summer, it might be insects that are landing dry on the water. Or spring, it might be nymphs. But what you do is you take this, you take this vise and you put your hook in there. And we're going to call the hook for this sake, we're going to call it the gospel, okay? Because once you're hooked by the gospel, you're hooked. <laughs> then you use these different materials, these natural materials, and you try to tie, you're trying to match whatever the fish are feeding on, okay? You need to, but it's your job to figure out what they need. It's your job to feed them as the fisherman. You're trying to figure that out. Because just like fish, people also are different, Right? So there might be some fish that prefer this, this big obnoxious looking fly darting through the water, something like that. And you might have the same type of fish that need more of something like that. You can't even see it. You can't even see it where you're sitting. Tiny, tiny little midge. It's just the tip of my finger here. And to give an example, this might be a a son, I love you, but your life's a wreck. You need to get your butt to church. That's an approach. That's not an approach that works for everybody. It's an approach that might work for someone. For the more difficult, it might just be forgiveness like Christ forgave. It might just be a word of encouragement. It just might be a, just a tiny seed planted. But as the fisherman, it's up to you to figure out how you're going to deliver the gospel. You have to match their hatch. You have to figure out what they're hungry for. And that's exactly what Jesus did in these following verses. I'm going to read the following verses after he just called Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Listen to what he does. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness, all kinds of disease among the people. And then his fame went throughout Syria, and they brought all the sick to him, People who were afflicted by, afflicted by various diseases and torments. And those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed them. And from Galilee, and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to be able to do what Jesus did. I'm not saying you're going to be able to just go pick someone up out of the wheelchair and they can stand again. Maybe I'm not, it's not for me to say who God grants power to, but what I'm trying to say is, is that Christ wasn't just preaching. Christ was fulfilling a need. He was traveling, seeking, listening, healing. All the while he was preaching and teaching. He was feeding these people. Do you see at this time, this is Jesus putting on a master class of how to fish for men. Do you know what separates a good fisherman from a poor one? I want you to picture this. Try to picture this with me. You approach a fine stretch of water. I know, I know, Liz. I'm losing some of them. Just hang in here, I promise. And you see a dark green seam between two rocks, and you know that it has to hold fish. You know that it has to hold fish. You run a couple casts, nothing, a well, next spot. That's the poor fisherman. Okay? The good one adapts. Maybe it needs more weight. Maybe you need something more flashy. Maybe you should approach approach the water differently. Here's what I'm trying to say. When the approach and the fly and the drift are all figured out, you have that fish. You have that fish because fish are hungry and need to eat. Fish have to eat. 
Likewise, people's souls are hungry and need to eat, have to eat. And your gospel, your tackle box, it has to be versatile. Fight the wind here. Your tackle box has to be versatile. And this is the gospel. When I did the lesson about Philip and the Ethiopian for the vacation Bible school for the kids, and we discussed evangelism, I'm aware that we're not all Billy Grahams. I'm certainly not. But I told those little kids that they can evangelize too. And you know why? It's because they already know the miracle of the birth, the servant life, his death, his resurrection, the grace and salvation. The gospel speaks for itself. You don't, you don't, it doesn't have to be you. The gospel will speak for itself. The hook will do its job. The gospel can reach the unreachable. That reminds me of a book I read a couple years ago. I want to read out of it by a man named Andrew Clavin. And he grew up a, what he would consider an intellectual atheist. Okay. He was a secular Jew turned Christian. This is what happened when a secular Jew heard the gospel, was fed the gospel. The fact was, as a story, even leaving out the supernatural, especially leaving out the supernatural, taking it all as a metaphor, the Bible made perfect sense to me from the very beginning. I saw a God whose nature was creative love. He made man in his own image for the purpose of forming new and free relationships with him. But in his freedom, man turned away from that relationship to consult his own wisdom and desires. He goes on to talk about some, some history, and I skipped that. That made sense to me too. Natural sense, not supernatural. That after all that history was complete, that a man might be born that could comprehend it wholly and recreate within himself a relationship at its source. His mind could contain both man and God. It made sense that the creatures of sin and history, not just the Jews, but all of us, would conspire in such a man's judicial murder. Jesus had to die because we had to kill him. It was either that or see ourselves by his light as the broken things we truly are. It's only from God's point of view that this is a redeeming sacrifice by living on earth in Jesus, by entering history, by experiencing death, by passing through the moment of absolute blackness when God is forsaken by God, God reunites himself with his fallen creation and reopens the path of the relationship lost in Eden. A secular Jew took that after hearing, after being fed the gospel. The gospel is power. And you have that power. And the gospel will speak for itself. Like I said, the hook will do its job. So just to recap, you fulfill a need. You find what they're hungry for. You deliver them the gospel. And then the Holy Spirit takes it from there. That's it. You're done. The job's over. So now the job's over. Let's talk about your equipment. This is a rod and reel, okay? You have it, you have it, you have it, you have it, you all have it. It might be possible that you don't know how to assemble it. It might be possible that you don't know how to align it, but as sure as I'm standing up here, you have it. And I'm gonna prove that you have it with scripture. We're gonna start with the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. That's what, this is what we're going to call the Holy Spirit. This is the fly, this is the fly reel. Okay, this, this has line that has the tight knots that holds the hook, that holds the fish on. It has the, the line, the fly line to help you, to help you deliver. It has this, this blue backing on it. It's a really strong braided line. What that does, that, that allows the fish to run and run and run and run and run, but still stay hooked and still be able to brought back. Allows the fish to run, but can still bring it back. It's doing the work. The Holy Spirit is doing the work. And the Holy Spirit controls them after you give the evangelism. Give it a second. <laughs> Let the tornado pass them. <clears throat> Acts 1, 6-8 says that when they gathered around him, they asked, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates that my father has set in his own authority. We did a, we did a Bible study with, with Pastor Robert Morris. 
And he said that he does not like it when Christians say, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, come back here and save us. Come, come save us from this wicked land because to because we ask Christ to come fix these problems when we are fully equipped with the same power and authority in us and the Holy Spirit. So for us to want Christ to come back instead, instead of us trying to win hearts and minds, is a cop out. Eight. But when you but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, and all of Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Don't just sit around and mope about the grotesque na nature of things. If you don't like something, change it. Fish. Pray. Change hearts. Bring people to the kingdom. That's your job. Just as much as it's my job to teach, it's my job to bring people to the kingdom while I'm here, while I have time here on earth. We're going to move to the butt section. Okay? This is the butt section. This is what we are going to call our foundation, our heart and our mind, foundate, the foundation in Christ. I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to hold these uh, pages down from blowing over. I'm going to attach the Holy Spirit to our foundation. You all know the uh, wise man that built his house upon the rock, the cornerstone. That's this. This is sturdy. This is the sturdiest part of your rod. This, this is where you do all the fighting. This is where you're going to fight the fish. Okay? That's sturdy. That's your foundation. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says that for no one can lay a foundation other than the one that I have already laid, which is Jesus Christ. That is your butt section. We're going to go to the first midsection. Your first midsection, and what we're going to do is we're going to call this the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. This is the Word. Read it. Soak it in. Read it again. How many times have we had to read things over and over again until it finally dawns on us what it means? 2 Timothy 3 tells us, But for you, but as for you, continue to do, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Because you know those from whom it lear you learned it. And how from infancy you have known that the Holy Scriptures were able to make you wise for salvation through Jesus Christ. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. I'm going to read that verse again because it is super important. I want to emphasize that. That all Scripture, all of it, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching as well as rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I told you I'm going to prove you have it. I told you I'm going to prove you have it. We're going to go to the second midsection. We're going to call this theology and understanding. OK, Paul told us last week we're all theologians, right? Hi, Jackson. <laughs> we're all theologians. Even Jackson's a theologian. But here's what we find. So this is this is our learning and our understanding, our studying. And here's where we find our evangelism. This is where we can find it, because remember, let's go back to Philip and the Ethiopian again. Let's go back to that story because the Ethiopian was reading out of the Isaiah scroll and Philip approached him and said, hey, buddy, do you know what you're reading? And the Ethiopian said, as a matter of fact, I do not. So then he used his understanding. Philip explained to him the gospel and they praised the Lord and it ended in a believer's baptism, all because of Philip's understanding. I want to look to Proverbs for understanding. Proverbs 2 starts out, my son, if you accept my words. So these are commands first, if you accept my words. And you store up my commands within you, turning an ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, those are strong words. And if you look for it as you look for silver, and if you search for it as for hidden treasure, you're looking hard. 
So you have to really seek. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. Go down to verse 9. And then you will understand what is right and just and fair in every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant for your soul. Discretion will protect you and understanding will guard you. It's more proof. Now, I do want to show you something because this is very possible too. What would happen if I took my theology and tried to make scripture fit it? I put it on like that. That's kind of sloppy. Maybe get some of that tape that's holding these holding these uh, tablecloths down. I can maybe tape that together. How's that? How's that rig look? Good? We fishing with that? Hunter, are we fishing with this? No, we're absolutely not fishing with this. You can't do that. That's what happens if you're going to let the world form your thoughts and form your theology. The only way, the only way that this works is to first have understanding and reading of the infallible word of God. Only then can you fit your theology and your understanding in this. And I want to show you something about this rod. Do you notice how it's going from sturdy to fragile? We are going for divine to human. Okay, we're about to get real human. This is divine. This is, this is the foundation. This is, this is the Christ side of you that's inside of you. This is your humanity. We're going to start into the humanity. Because finally we're going to talk about the tip. The tip is the most sensitive and easily broken part of this rod. It is often broken from stupid mistakes. Fishermen will put too much pressure on it, shut it car doors, catch it in trees. It is fragile and easily broken. So as far as your fishing goes, I'm going to call this our words and actions. Because I have had the Holy Spirit. I have had the foundation of Christ. I have had, I have read the scriptures, I have understood the scriptures, and I have still broken this tip with harsh words and actions that did not reflect Christ. And the problem is, the bad news is, is that in those times, I'm not fishing because I can't. But the good news is, is that the rod companies know that we mess these up a lot and they're easily purchased they're easily fixed. And in some cases, like with this rod company, you're given a second chance. <laughs> you're going to break this tip. Like I said, you're, you're, gonna, you're going to be mending your net constantly. But we're sinners that are saved by grace and the same grace that we want others to experience and to have. And if you know the glory of the grace, then it's your job to share it with someone. And even with all this, even when your words and actions are on point, I've been skunked. I've been defeated by the water, cold, wet, fishless. But I'm always learning. And in that time, in that time of being defeated, if I would have just given up, I'd stop fishing. I would have be done. But 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in love and in the work of the Lord, knowing that, your Lord, that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Look, you might not reach a brother. You might come across a hardened heart. You might be laughed at. You might be made fun of. But it's never in vain. If you feel like any of your work in the Lord has ever been in vain, that is not, that is the devil. That is the devil working and he can't win. But when you align everything correctly, sorry, there's a fly rod, so it's really long. When you align everything correctly, and this is you then. This is you. You are the rod and reel as a whole. You're a finely tuned fisher of men. You can be. Everyone in here can be. And you have this equipment. 
per the scripture I read. Let's pray. Father God, I just ask that you help us to drop our broken nets, to follow you, and to become fishers of men. You have given us all we need, Lord, and I just, I'm just thankful for our abounding blessings. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you fill this pavilion today. I want to give a special blessing to all those who want to declare, make a declaration today for Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Father God, I just ask that you give us a desire to win hearts for the kingdom. Guide us as we leave here today. I ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So we'll sing, uh, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a magnificent fisherman we will be. <laughs> 544, yeah.